Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host, also the host of Wing Shooting USA, the television show uh, now back on Pursuit Channel for first quarter of 2020. So watch for that as well. We got a great show in store for you already, a long line of callers because the topic is near and dear to everybody's hearts, at least everybody who listens to the Upland Nation podcast. Your biggest dog training challenge. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. <laughs> and that's why we're here today. On top of all the calls and questions and hopefully some answers, I'll have a public access tip for you, a new place to hunt. And we'll take a quick look at Ronnie Smith's new book. I should call it Ronnie Smith Kennels because Susanna Love, the uh, better half of that equation, is just as well represented in that book. We'll talk about all of that and a whole bunch more coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. First off, how was your Christmas? Hanukkah, whatever else you celebrated. Maybe you just celebrated the end of 2019. Boy, I am sure glad to see it go. Maybe you too. By now, some of the presents are probably broken or lost. The mess is cleaned up and we're back to the important stuff, hunting. Still got a little bit of time left in many of the seasons. Uh, We can hunt chuckers in, uh, and and quail too, for that matter, in Oregon until the end of January. If I'm lucky, I'll make it to uh, February's uh, two-week season left in Nevada. Uh, Some of you folks in the far southeast and southwest have even longer seasons. I'm jealous about that, but I'll be spending time in Las Vegas indoors for the SHOT Show real soon. Got any trips planned? Share them on Facebook, Wing Shooting USA Facebook page, or the Upland Nation Facebook page, either one. And make sure you get out there and enjoy the heck out of yourself and your dog and wherever you're headed. Hey, do me a favor if you can. The only reason that this is uh, this podcast is on the air, so to speak, is to help you. And if it does, please subscribe, uh, provide a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatever. Sure would appreciate that. It also gives us a little bit of feedback on how we're doing, and that's as important as anything else. Okay, hey, some sold-out stuff at sageandbreaker.com, but they got more finally in stock after the big Christmas rush. Thank you for responding so well to their um, Christmas package, the dog <laughs> dog cleaning. Uh, sorry, Fred, I've done that before, and I'll do it again. Gun cleaning combo <laughs> sold out thanks to you folks. New product in line these days, a gun cleaning chamois that's washable, reusable, and highly absorbent. It's a micro suede, so it's not that natural material that we used to use on our cars back in the day when we cared about that stuff. Now we don't. Don't forget to sign up for their email list. That's how you find out about new stuff like this gun cleaning chamois. Sage and Breaker dot com for the best in gun cleaning and gun care products and i'll tell you for the best in dual dog training collar systems you can't go wrong with the dogtra tnb dual simple guys like me need simple products and this is one no toggling back and forth from one dog to the other when you're out in the field training or just looking for them and trying to hit the beeper so you can hear them it's all right there in black and white, so to speak, two sets of buttons, one for each dog. The Dog Tra Pathfinder. Learn more at dogtra.com. Well, talking about the biggest challenges when we come to training our dogs, and right now I've got one that I am well, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on once the season ends. Not until then because I want to have a little bit more fun and I don't want to introduce any stress for Flick right now. Still a young dog, but I want him to be steady to wing shot and fall next year. He's doing great on pigeons, no matter where we are. You know, the whole place learning thing is uh, has fallen into place. But on game birds, a little bit tougher. I don't know if it's because they smell different. I don't know if it's because they behave differently. Whatever it is, I'm going to buy some training quail and then ultimately some training chuckers and pheasants and 
and do it right. If that's one of your challenges, let's uh, live it together. We'll be talking on Facebook and on my blog at scottlindenoutdoors.com about all of that and a whole bunch more. Right now, it's your turn. Let's go to the phones. Ian, first on the line with me, Michael Pierre. You're calling from somewhere in Idaho, it looks like. Yeah, Twin Falls, Idaho, actually. Yeah, you know, I was talking off air. I, I also spent a week in Twin Falls about one night ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had, yep. had a high-quality hotel experience, which uh, is hard, <laughs> hard to get in Twin Falls, I think, but it was fun. Yeah. And it was uh, the last stop on my way home from a long trip to Kansas. So thank you, Twin Falls, for being so hospitable. Oh, yeah. They're great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> and I mean that. I'm, I'm not being facetious at the, at the moment. <laughs> so tell me, what kind of dog do you have? I have a, a Warrior Griffin. Okay. Hey, good for yep. you. Um, yeah. we're, so we're kind of cousins then. Yeah, actually. My uh, my dog's more of the tighter coat, so a lot of people do think he's a, a German wire hair. And that's a good that's a good thing when you're coming out of some of the st sticker bushes and things like that. I'm sure. Oh yes, it's uh, there's there's a few times I come out of uh, if I'm doing some quail hunting. Mostly he comes out and his face is covered, but uh, the rest of them does pretty good though. Well, that's good for you, and 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 good luck at the tail end of your season. <laughs> So, so when I pose the question, uh, what is your biggest dog training challenge? Uh, you were quick to point out that it was a uh, force fetch with your first pointing dog. Does that mean you had retrievers in the past? I did. Yeah. This is my first, uh, pointing dog before this I've, uh, I've had labs. Uh, so, um, I've never had an issue before this with desire to retrieve and, you know, most people, that have owned labs don't really have that issue but um with this dog i've i've you know he does okay retrieving but it's it's been a little bit of a, a process with him so it's uh it's a learning curve for me for sure well it never ends by the way so don't get cocky or anything <laughs> oh i'm not I'm, <laughs> this this is his second actual hunting season um with me so He's, uh, like I said, he's a little over two now, and uh, and I just, right now, I'm having the issue of he'll, most of the time, he'll go retrieve the bird, but he's stopping short about eight feet from me, from bringing it all the way <laughs> to me. So, and you know how that goes if you have a winged bird or whatnot, it, it can be kind of a frustrating <laughs> thing to yeah. go through, but... Well, so yeah, so we're working on force fetch right now, trying to. All right, so you're going through the the whole process, and we don't need to get into it, but you yep. you know what it is, I know what it is, most of our listeners yep. will know what force training is, um, and do you, do you see the the light at the end of the tunnel is, or is there just uh, are you are you just not there yet, or do you need something in particular to get you across the finish line? Um, well, I'm, I'm not quite, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel yet outside of, uh, I'm surrounded by a lot of, uh, people who have experience and, and they assure me that this is the process. It's normal. But at this moment, I'm at the, towards the beginning of the force fetch. And yeah. so the, the light at the end of the tunnel is a little ways away from yeah. me right now, but, um, I'm assured that I can get there if I'm consistent and I push through it. <laughs> well, you know, and that's absolutely right. I'll tell you, this is my fifth wire haired breed dog, my, my fifth German wire hair. So, you know, I go through, I live through this with every dog and some have been okay. And some have been spectacular. Flick is probably the same age as your dog. And he's, he's gotten it all the way back, but he doesn't deliver to hand. He delivers to foot. Okay. So, um, you know, and, and I guess the first question I would ask of you is how did you, uh, what are you using as the incentive? Did you use an ear pinch, a toe pinch? Did you use electric collar? You know, what was that? Uh, what do you use as your enforcer? Well, so far, uh, like where I'm at in this, I haven't gotten to a collar conditioning in the force fetch yet. I have had them, uh, you know, I've worked the color conditioning on other things, but right now I'm more at uh, 
all it's taking is just a little ear pinch. He's a little bit on the softer side, if you know what I mean. Like, it yeah. doesn't take much for him to, like, oh, man, that's that's not okay. Yeah. That hurts a little bit. And so I think I'll be able to get through most of it with the ear pinch, but then I do want to work into the collar for, you know, field purposes. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I want I want to get to that point for sure you know uh, know, the cliche is you know the collar is like a thousand yard check cord you can't pinch an ear at a thousand yards but you can press a red button for sure um so do you know my my thought and i'm no expert on this which is why tomorrow i'll be talking (laughs) with an expert about this and you'll you'll have to tune in for the podcast following this podcast for that okay but um the first thing I would think about is overlaying ear pinch with the collar of one sort or another. And I, I have a soft dog too, believe it or not. My wire hair is, he, he, he gets mad when I stare at him wrong. So yep. He gets sad. So yep, I, exactly. um, so I, I don't use uh, stimulation. I use, I have a, I have one of those dog for a TNB dual collars with the best vibrating function I've okay. ever found on a collar. So instead of uh, stimulation, he gets the vibrate. And that's just a little reminder that won't freak him out that you can give from eight feet away when he's not bringing it all the way back. You might consider that overlay process yeah. starting back on the table so that he understands what it is the whole time. Um, then the other thing as a short-term solution that I've found has worked extremely well with a lot of dogs and some people will cringe when I recommend this, but if that dog is coming to you and you know, he's going to hit the brakes before he gets all the way back to you, try backing up as he's coming to you or even turning around and walking, walking away pretty, pretty quickly. And the the kind of the, it will stimulate kind of the chase instinct in your dog. And then as he's Mm -hmm. coming to catch up to you, to chase you, turn around and, Hold his collar. Maybe not no. take, don't take the bird away from him because a lot of times dogs are reluctant to bring that bird all the way back because they know the moment you do get to him, you're taking that pleasure out of his mouth. Mm. Um, yeah, that and, makes sense. And I have been all around on this one and I am a true believer now in, uh, you know, they're called bird dogs for a reason. So if the first thing we do is take away the only reward <laughs> they have, it's no wonder they don't want to come back. Yeah. So yeah. consider all those things, especially when you're training with, uh, real birds. And if, yeah. and if you're not training with real birds, go out and kill a bunch, wrap them in paper bags. I just learned that one. That hmm. way they're not slimy and wet the whole time. When you put them in the freezer, they dry out again and, and they're, huh. they're usable over and over again. I get, I get probably five different days worth of use out of a frozen bird. If I just put it back in the freezer and put it in a paper bag instead. Paper bag. Huh? Yeah. that makes sense there. So there, you got your money's worth on that one, didn't you? Yeah, I did. And uh-huh. I do have I do have some frozen birds, but you know I just put them in Ziplocs and and use them that way. But you're right; it, it does get that kind of you know uh, whatever you know texture, weird texture, slime. On yeah, it. yeah, and, um, and, and as we all know, freezers are uh, they dry everything out. That's what freezer yep. burn really is. So uh, yeah, yeah, you know, use it to your advantage for a change instead instead of getting your wife mad at you for not wrapping up the chicken <laughs> correctly exactly all right well good good luck on those and like i said i'm going to be talking with probably the master on uh, on retrieving training in the next podcast so subscribe and give me a five-star rating when you subscribe and then uh i'll uh, i'll be grateful forever okay i will i will definitely do that all right then good luck to you and stay Uh, stay in touch man i love it when i hit a home run and i hope i did for you michael now it's uh jason yoshimura you're on the line from somewhere way far away i think where are you jason i'm out in charlotte north carolina actually oh yeah nice place uh visited there once on the way to somewhere even hotter and more humid but that's another (laughs) story (laughs) what kind of dogs you're running jason i have my first poodle pointer actually Amen and good luck to you. They're a great breed. If I if I wasn't so besotten with my German wirehead pointers, that'd be my next breed of choice. How old's the dog? A year and a half now. 
Oh man, when Actually, you, uh, no, I apologize. He's coming up. He is two years in February. Actually. Well, there's no difference. Not until they're about five. So don't worry. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, um, you, you know, I can feel your pain no matter what it's about, but uh, tell me what is your biggest dog training challenge these days? You know, it, it's a mix. And I could tell you if you were at the NAVDA events I've been at, they'd say, well, it just depends on the day he shows up. Um, you know, the fetch really hasn't been an issue until we're out in the field. Yeah. And it's one of those, it's like, he just, it's a whole different dog. All of a sudden he hits the field training. And there's a difference. If I'm training in the field, he's, he's been spot on nine times out of 10. And then I'd get to the real thing and he just, it all goes back out the window. He's fresh out the gate, running all over the place, tearing through the field. He's not retrieving the birds to hand, you know, every single time towards the end of the hunt he'll start doing it as he's supposed to um there's just it's a there's a handful of stuff and it's one of those i could see that i made a difference with the training whether it's with fetch whether it's walking at heel um it, whether it's just whoa whoa training but i've noticed it's just i haven't quite got anything mastered and going back when i started the trainings i noticed that you know after however many months it went by maybe i had skipped a step or two thinking you know what i think he's got that let's start moving to the next just out of being anxious and being yeah. new to it yeah. all yeah yeah you know i am nodding my head you can't tell that but i am for a whole bunch of reasons number one i've been there and i've done that you mm -hmm. should have seen our first natural ability test five dogs ago um, and, and for those of you who are wondering, you know, uh, make sure your dog goes through that whole test in your yard and then in some other places as well. And don't forget, don't forget part of the test. The judges are going to reach back there and count testicles. Mm -hmm. And if that dog isn't ready for that, boy, oh boy, it's a rodeo real fast. Um, <laughs> but uh, to, to your point, Jason, um, he's, he's still a puppy. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm reminded of that because we, you know, our little training group that I've referred to before on the podcast is full of dogs about the age of your dog and my dog. And, and they, you know, they, they, they can retain only so much. And the, 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 the retrieving part of it is such a complicated process. And it's so easy to, to booger it up with other stimuli out in the field um, that, keep your expectations low for a while and i think that'll help and if you're seeing progress again that is the most exciting thing i got out of all the guys in our training group we all went our separate ways once the season started and i'm getting reports almost every week from all of them and they're all thinking wow you know we did make some progress we're not where we want to be ultimately but but it i mean all i can do is tell you it you're getting there and uh, and don't take it out on the dog if he regresses every once in a while <laughs> oh yeah trust me i've uh i've told people i was like if anyone's been trained between the relationship of myself and my dog more it's probably been myself <laughs> because the patience is something i had to work on i knew i had to work on i said that if there's anything that's going to test me better than this it's having you know virtual breed and trying to get him through this and yeah i mean like you said the the natural ability test i hadn't actually ran through the test you know front to back and just had the time to do it and i had a, a bad injury leading up to it you know a, a month or two before it all this kind of just snowballed as yeah. you're getting up to it so it kind of screwed myself up with the training he ends up going out there and me not knowing what the test was like i thought for sure he wasn't going to prize at all i mean mm -hmm. i was like what is, i mean the field portion was uncharacteristic of him but he, he ended up testing pretty well he did prize two out of it a high prize two and you know going back and seeing some of the dogs running through their training day for the ut tests and everything it, it, and just speaking with the folks that's the one thing i've taken from this um was get around a lot of people that have done it and they will constantly remind you like hey your dog's doing great yes He's young you yep. just have to be patient and like you said, keep your expectations low. And, you know, when I come off of the day of, wow, I'm disappointed because he's been doing this well and that well and he didn't perform, I always remind myself, like, hey, you've taken a step in the right direction, even though it doesn't feel like it. And one day it's all going to come together. And like you said, you know, give it until you know, they're four or five years old and you'll start seeing 
every all the puzzle pieces kind of come together so yeah it's i mean it, it will be there you know someday we'll well the closest thing we have to a 12-step program is navda so stay involved um you know if if people out there aren't members yet and they have a versatile dog i would suggest number one join number two start attending events before you start testing your own dog whether it's training uh, training days or even help it, you you should help anyway. But start helping out at tests so that you're you are familiar with the whole thing. And then our chapters. I mean, I'm a member of at least two, maybe three. I can't remember. I'll have to ask my bookkeeper. But <laughs> but but our chapters have um, have mock tests quite often, and I think a lot of others do as well. So you can go out there and run the test, if you will. The weekend before so your dog understands every aspect of it and and that's a, a big part of what this is all about is your dog he 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 must not be surprised by any of the things he's going to encounter and the only way to do that is to acquaint him with those over the course of time so you're on the right yeah. track it's it's a matter of time you got a great dog i'm sure it's well bred because there's no such thing otherwise in that breed in the united states the poodle pointer alliance is an incredible group of folks who know what they're doing and um i'm sure that um it's just a matter of time so good luck to you oh thank you very much i've got good supporting cast helping me along the way that's the way to do it hey Good to talk with you. Good luck with that puppy. And I'll watch for you in the test results in an upcoming edition of the Versatile Hunting Dog Magazine. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Algello's comment on Facebook is about the same. It's really funny how things come together. He says, the best thing I can do is train myself to keep my mouth shut and let my dog do what he knows what, how to do. That's go hunting. That's kind of apropos of the same thing we've just been talking about. And uh, back to the phones we go. Greg Scott Long, you're calling from just over the hill. If I lean to the right and hold my tongue correctly, I might be able to wave at you. How are you doing over there? <laughs> Fine. Great. Thank you. Good. Um, we are on opposite sides of the Cascade Mountain Range, uh, but we're probably members of the same dog club now that I think about it. What kind of dog are you running these days? Well, uh, I'm running a five-year-old Brittany that is uh, a senior hunter titled. Uh, I do uh, mostly hunt testing and uh, hunting of that dog, a little tiny bit of field trialing, but not a whole lot. And then I'm also working with a uh, five-year-old flusher, Springer Spaniel, that uh, uh, I'm taking through the HRC program. You ever hunt them together? Uh, no, not really. Um, that's more chaos than I can yeah. handle as a handler at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I tend to run them independently. You sound yeah. surprisingly well balanced, which means you don't do that. Yeah. I'm glad to hear someday, uh, someday you'll be tempted to, I'm sure. I know I am all the time, but I, I'm like you, I got enough worries. So, um, you know, the big, uh, the big question is what, what are the challenges you're facing with your dog training these days? Do you have a flushing problem or a pointing dog problem? No, really my biggest challenge aside from finding time to work with the dogs productively is with honoring and backing on my mm -hmm. pointer. I find it extremely challenging, um, to train for that skill by myself as I'm often working with the dogs by myself, sometimes I will um, pair up with some people and we'll run some braces, and, and then that that's great. But unfortunately, those opportunities don't happen as often as I would like. So I'm working by myself with my pointer and um, really training for uh, really solid backing and honoring using silhouettes or backing dummies um, only goes so far. I, f I find that he gets rock solid to the silhouettes and, and the dummies. He figures them out. He, he's just great. Then we'll get in the field or in a, a, a test type of scenario. The adrenaline's up. We've got other dogs and, and live birds. And uh, now he's not dealing with silhouettes and, and, and dummies and things. Yeah. Don't go as solid as I would like let's see here um you're you're doing all the things i've done in the past uh you ever um put 
you ever put live birds behind those dummies and those uh, those silhouette dogs and then fly those birds? Yeah, I've done that. I use um, homing pigeons that, that I raise quite a bit. Occasionally, yeah, I'll use some chuckers. Um, and, and that helps, definitely. I don't necessarily um, do that as often as, as maybe I could. I think where I really struggle with him is, is getting him solid to where, you know, say, for example, in a callback situation in a hunt test, where maybe his brace mate uh, was disqualified and my dog's shown all the other skills but hasn't had a chance to honor, we go into a callback situation where now we're sort of running it like a production line, you know. Yeah, I know it well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so really what the judges want to see, for example, is, you know, you sort of let your dog go guide him up and then they want to see him just sort of lock up when, when he sees that other dog. And, and, you know, sometimes my dog will blink him a little bit and say, well, I'm going to go over here and, and then I'll, I'll maybe woe up. And, and it's not quite as tight as, as I would like. And, and I just can't seem to quite get that, that instantaneous lockup yeah. Um, yeah. On, on the training. Well, you know, half the problem in a callback, especially is the gallery and you and your dog are standing right there and they put the dang bird out 20 yards away. And, and so everybody sees everything happening. And then they, they bring in the, the by dog in that case. And it's just not as the, the drama isn't there. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, quite often, and you've probably done the same thing, especially if you have one of those backing uh, silhouettes that you can remote control up and down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's no surprise aspect in any of that. It's all right there. And That's so, right. The, you know, the dog is, you know, he's phoning it in because there's nothing uh, exciting about it. Um, <clears throat> can you set up more? I, I know I, I know what you mean, though. It's hard to find other people to do this with because they got to be at, the, you know, a certain level with their dogs as well. But, man, I would be I would be looking for every possible situation to do that. And I'm wondering about one other way to do it with your other dog. Will that dog stand still? Yeah, you know, that's something I thought of as well. Yes, I can get that dog to to woe up or at least to do a place. He he'll he'll not necessarily stand on a point, obviously being yeah. a flusher, but yeah. I do have him trained to the point where he'll place successfully. Yeah. Um and so the pointer though is encountering usually a sitting dog. Yeah. Which of yeah. course he's he's not gonna see in the field. Yeah. Um so you know, when, when we've got other pointers that I can train with, yeah, then you, of course we get the most realistic scenario. Sure. It's just, uh, you know, I, I need, uh, maybe I need to get my wife more involved in pointing dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, I hate to think it's, it, it's only as a training assistant though, you're going to be in big trouble if that's all yeah. she gets to do. But yeah, yeah you know, I, I, I don't, are you a member of a club over there of any sort? Yeah. I participate with the, uh, Green Valley yeah, hunting and sure. retriever club. Yeah. yeah. And I do train with some of the members there as often as we can. You know, it's uh, everybody works, everybody has a busy life. And, and then, you know, of course, uh, uh, sometimes it can be a challenge to find a place to, to train the dogs, particularly the bigger running pointers. Yeah. So we do what we can. We definitely try. It's just, uh, um, y- you know, I'm, I'm sort of faced as are a lot of people. I, I just have to kind of train on my own more than I would like. Yeah, you know, I I for years and years ago I bought uh, actually from Germany I think it came, I bought what lo- it's almost eerily realistic. It, it it looks like a it's a plush dog toy dog shaped toy. It looks like a short hair. And, oh no kidding! I mean it's it's 3D and the whole Megillah. So you know, there's one more thing you might shop for just to, you know for a change of uh, stimulus, uh, if, if nothing else, but you know, the other thing you could do, because I know that area slightly well, I guess uh, that doesn't sound very clever. Does it? I know that area slightly. I think I'm still a member of 
another chapter that's over there. Join the NAVDA chapter in the area, the Willamette Valley chapter. All, uh -huh. all of a sudden, your contacts will be doubled. And those are folks, I joke about it, but it's true to a great degree. NAVDA chapters are populated in large part by retired old guys with nothing better to do, better to do than train. So, so, you know, you, you can almost always find somebody who would be glad to help you as long as you can help them as well. Uh, but it sounds like, you know, repetition, exposure yep. to the real thing. Yep. You could always add more, uh, more of your homing pigeons to the, um, to the, to the silhouette. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. is always a good way, especially if your dog is, is steady to wing shot and flush even uh to you know wild flushes um mm -hmm. that kind of stuff will just ingrain it even more and those those are the thoughts i i might i might throw at you right now and the best way to do that is to basically say have the pigeon in a trap yeah and then yeah. release and then yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So the dog, you bring the dog around the corner or from somewhere where he can't see the silhouette to where he can see the silhouette. And the moment he sees it, hit the button on that remote launcher and fly the bird. The dog's immediate reaction is, oh, I better stop because I've been trained to stop to flush. Yeah. Yeah. And he starts putting the two and two together. And then after a while, what you do is you lay down that uh, well, you don't even have to do bother with that. You let him get some retrieves out of that after he's starting to do it well. And mm -hmm. all, all of a sudden it's, you know, two and two and two and two, that makes eight in this case. And, um, it, it might help a little bit. That's a great idea. Yeah. I think I, I can certainly reinforce that more cause I do have a, a pretty good, um, uh, uh, gathering of, of homing pigeons at the ready so yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and just yeah. remember that you know at some point after he finally gets it you want him to to make some retrieves now you don't have to kill any birds for that you probably already have dead birds somewhere in your in your freezer or something but i you know he doesn't care yeah. you you let yeah. the live one fly back to the to the loft and you lo yeah. you lob a, a dead one out there he says oh i get it so when i yep. do everything he wants me to do i get to carry a dead bird around for a while yep yep i'm like uh, all the rest of us i've got got bird sickles in the freezer Good. so it's Good. uh yeah okay that's great advice yeah i i think uh maybe that's what i'll do is try to reinforce that more and more yeah and, and see if i can build in some uh uh, you know, it's just uh, we've really gotten killed on some of the callback situations for the honor. And I just I, I always feel like I'm not setting the dog up for success, either through the training or the way I'm running the dog into the callback. I just, um, you know, I, I, I think there's the dog needs to learn and I need to learn, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, so. <laughs> you know, half the training it, it ought to be the human that's being trained, of course. And but, it, you know, it's hard. It's easy to make an excuse that is pretty practically true. And that is I, I don't have a lot of training partners. I can't do that. If yeah. you improvise a little bit in in some ways and, and use that trick with the live bird behind the 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 cutout, I think I think you'll make massive strides. Great. I will do that. Yeah. All right. That, that's a great suggestion. Appreciate that. Good luck to you. And thank uh, you very much. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll probably run into you somewhere over there in the next banquet season. I hope so. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Man. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for the call. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. All right. Bye bye. Talked earlier about some of my goals for next season. And, uh, that's one of mine as well. Until then, uh, it's a rodeo every time we got two dogs on the ground and one bird. Uh, Flick's doing better at it, but uh, he's not polished at all, and I don't think he really understands what a back is quite yet. All right, boy, oh boy, I am just loving this. You know, we we do this at Pheasant Fest and then at, uh, at the Cabela store in Mitchell as well. I put up a big sign and say, got a dog, ask a question. Well, Kara... Hanson Whitaker asked a question. Why don't you repeat it for our listening audience, Kara? My big question is on steadiness, um, especially as to sort of when to start the steadiness process with a young dog. Yeah. Okay. So how old is your dog and what kind is it? Um, I have small Munster Launders. Okay. And our youngest is just turned a year old. Are you a member of a NAVDA chapter? Yes, sir. Okay, well, Absolutely. 
you're going to get way better advice from all of those guys than from me, that's for sure. But but I'm working on the same thing here, and it may be the only thing that my young dog, Flick, is doing extremely well. I'm bragging about it because it doesn't happen often enough. But I was chucker hunting last Sunday, and uh, my GPS caller told me he was 300 yards down that gully there. So I followed down, and sure enough, he was still there 15 minutes later when I uh, rolled my way to him, and he was still on point, and the chuckers didn't wait the last 10 seconds before I could get below him to take the shot. But wow. But he's working on that, and part of it is just repetition, 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 but you know that. You hear it all the time. and, and, and It is. And, uh, you know, you can't do enough of that, but you also got to remember that the dog's got to have motivation for being able to stay on point for that long. Um, I don't think it's too early to start working on it. I think you do need to keep your expectations realistic with a one-year-old small monster lander, especially, um, because they mature a little bit slower. You know that you, you've had more than one. Yeah, Uh, I have, I have, and they have all been different. And so it's a, It's a learning curve with each one of them. (laughs) Yeah, isn't it? You know, it's too bad for that, but that's the joy of it as well. All right, have have you exposed, what's your dog's name, by the way? Uh, Rye. Rye, like the whiskey? Like the whiskey. Okay, I just had a great one. If I can remember what it was, it sounds like you might want to know about this. Let's see, what was it? (laughs) Uh, I'm sure I'll come up with it. But anyway, maybe I won't. I had a lot of it that night. But... um, have you worked with birds and steadiness with rye yet? We have. Okay. We have. Um, she did her natural ability test at yeah. nine months. Yeah. Um, and I was hoping that would be her last experience um, catching a bird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> laughing um, with you, not at you. <laughs> yep. Um, so we've now work, started um, working on pigeons. Yeah. Um, have left, learned my lesson with definitely using pigeons and not using quail for steadiness Mm -hmm. um definitely i think now know that nothing um nothing could be better but wild birds but they are hard to get hold of down here yeah um i live in north florida right over the georgia line um so just a i kind of kind of to balance between drive and keeping them interested you know and not messing with their point too much because you've done too much of one thing. Yeah. You know, the first thing that I I learned a long time ago is if I get three good renditions of whatever I'm trying to train, we're done for at least a half a day. So if you get three performances that you like, depending on where you are in that process, I'd, I'd put them up for at least an hour or two, maybe more. Um, but you know what I found, cause we're the same way. I mean, I, I'm out here in the West and, and we're not allowed, to, we're, we're not really supposed to be training on wild birds except during bird season. So, right. we, you know, I got a, I got a pen full of pigeons and I use them a lot. And I, uh, I experimented with a lot of these things. The, the best investment you might make is a remote controlled bird launcher. And with that, you can almost simulate wild bird situations. Um, If you have uh, homing pigeons, all the better, because you don't have to just keep laying out money for more birds. But one way or the other, what it allows you to do is it allows the dog to learn exactly what he learns when he's hunting wild birds on the prairies of Saskatchewan in in July. That when Mm -hmm. when he gets too close or he crashes in, there's no bird it's gone uh so well you know he loses all motivation for that and um and if when he does it right even if it's as a young dog even it's a if it's a four second point um then he can get a reward of some sort um depending again on where you are in the process if he's on a check cord you can actually keep him steady and he won't be chasing those birds but even if he does that's the reward for a while until you're ready to work on the steady to wing shot and and fall part of it so so i would invest in one of those i'm a big believer in those i've worn a couple out over the years and over the dogs (laughs) for that reason and and i you know uh 
I talk about them a lot and they're great guys. I love them all. The, our little training group in the summertime is they're the guinea pigs for all sorts of theories that I throw out at them. And, and this one has worked extremely well. So buy one. It'll be the best investment short of your small monster lander that you've ever made. Uh, you can then train by yourself. He'll never catch a bird. It's all about keeping an eye on the dog, not the bird. When you're, when you're training him with this stuff, you, you put your finger on the button and watch the dog. And when he crashes in, fly the bird. Yep. Or we will, we will be spending the, our next few months. Uh, that's what we will be working on. Yeah. Because... And I've got you know, an older one that's in a different, different phase. And I've done things a little bit different with him. He's now uh, ready to run his utility test, but I've done steadiness a little bit different with him. He was, his was more of steadiness to wing, you know, to wing shot and fall. He had that really nice staunch point that he's held really nicely. And Rye being a girl, she seems to have a little bit different personality and a little bit different way of doing things. Well, and you know, like you said, and and I agree. It you know, everyone is different, and yeah. so at 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 some point, she'll the light will go on, and that'll be that. But in the meanwhile, you know, it's all about extending the the length of that point, and uh, you know, it might be two seconds for a while, and it'll be a minute and a half, and then at some point, it'll be. 15 minutes so you can fall all the way down the hill to get to your dog on point on a covey of chuckers. But anyway, good luck with your smalls and uh, good luck in the new year. Thanks for being on the Upland Nation podcast. Well, we're pretty much warmed up by now, aren't we? Uh, Still plenty more callers and hopefully uh, we're getting to some questions that you have as well. Uh, We do have a quick break coming up. Got to pay the bills around here. But uh, after the break, uh, we'll talk about finding pigeons to train with and then more of your questions about the biggest dog training challenges you have. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast right after this bit of information from my friends at ESPamerica.com. I was reminded a couple nights ago while reading that there was this slight buzzing in my right ear and it's because for years and years I shot in the field without hearing protection. Now I am doing everything in my power including using ESP America hearing protection devices in the field so that I don't lose any more of my hearing. Wondering about how all that works? Well, it's pretty simple. You can be custom fitted right in your own town and there is a 30 day money back guarantee. So once they're fitted and you are using them, believe me, I doubt you'll want to take Jack up on his 30 day money back guarantee. Learn more at ESPAmerica.com. And, well, you didn't think you could get more advice on dog training than you've already gotten. We are back with more. The entire podcast is about dog training challenges. And it seems to me, talking to people all over the country, one of the biggest challenges is finding training birds. If you can find them, they might be expensive, they might be hard to import, if you will, to transport in one way or another. And then there are a lot of folks who simply won't give up their bird supplier for anything. You might try a couple of these sources if you are in need of training birds. First off, talk to your club members. Some of them may have extra birds. Some of them may know of somebody who has birds that you don't know of. In your town, there may be a branch of what they're now calling, I think, the United States Wildlife Services Department. Uh, We used to call them the government trapper. Kick around, see if they're out there doing anything. Quite often, they're doing urban pigeon removal. That might be worth a look as well. Talk to local business owners who have pigeons all over their roof. Whether it's an agribusiness or a retail business, we got them all over the lumber and uh, timber company uh, roofs and uh, mills around here. 
find out if there's a pigeon racing club in your community. And then ultimately, you might want to talk to the folks at 4-H. Want to be a little circumspect, cir circumspect, circumspect about that one because some of these kids get pretty attached to some of their birds, but they can't keep a lot of them. So somebody's got to take them away. Whatever you do, remember, no birds, no bird dog. So keep looking and good luck. Did want to plug Ronnie Smith Kennel's new book. It comes out courtesy of uh, Universe Publishing in Orvis. It's called Training Bird Dogs with Ronnie Smith Kennels. And once again, let's remember that the other half of Ronnie Smith Kennels is Susanna Love, an equal partner in that whole process. Boy, I'll tell you, if you want to learn about the inside, the why as well as the how of dog training, how great trainers think, how great trainers perceive their dogs and what they're doing, this is the book for you. It's thick, it's big, it's beautiful. Photo photographs by John Brian Grossenbacher and a lot of help on the copywriting by Reed Bryant. It is worth whatever they're asking for it. And like I was trained to say many years ago, it's available wherever books are sold. And when you are training your dog with Ronnie Smith Kennel's book or anything else, then you will probably want to invest in a great training collar. My choice these days, Dogtra and their T&B Dual. One reason, 10% off if you use the code SLUN10. Another, free shipping on any purchase over 200 bucks. And then one more because it is so simple to operate. Everything from two sets of buttons so you don't have to toggle back and forth or trying to find something on the touch screen. It's all right there in front of you and you can do it with your fingers, even if you have gloves on. And the battery life is exceptional. I am enamored with long battery life in virtually everything I do, including my truck where I just spent 800 bucks on a couple more. So believe me, battery life is a high priority. And in a collar, there's nothing worse than not having it. Find out more at dogter.com. And remember, S-L-U-N-10 will get you 10% off any purchase over 200 bucks. All right. Well, I am going to move things up a little bit right now and talk about this land being your land, our public land, public access feature, because we got a lot of callers on the line. I want to get to them ASAP. So um, let's see. Matt, Peter, Dave, Lance, Kevin, hang on. We'll get to you just as soon as we can. But Many of you are always looking for new places to go, and I'll have more news in that regard very soon. But in the meanwhile, I want to make a suggestion. Look beyond the yellow and the green and the brown patches on your topo map, or if you have one, an Onyx or other mapping application of one sort or another, to an unsung hero in the public access world, and that is the Federal Bureau of Reclamation kind of a misnomer these days because fundamentally all they do now is build dams and manage them but they are around water and they're managing the property around water all the time throughout this great country of ours and if you're looking for something a little bit off the beaten track maybe a little less commonly used for bird hunting Take a look at some of that Bureau of Reclamation land. I'm envisioning a spot along the Oahe Reservoir in South Dakota right now that has yielded plenty of pheasants for me, and I've never seen another hunter on it. Good luck with that one. Now let's get back to the calls. And our next caller is up there by my in-laws in the 360 area code. Dave McCarty, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott, it's great to be with you. And what kind of dogs are you running these days, Dave? Uh, running Dermot Shore Hair Pointer. Excellent. And um, how's your season going so far? 
so far it's pretty good pretty good yeah had about 20 trips out this year and and um, been finding some birds and putting some in the bag and it's been a good year yeah. so, so we're talking about biggest dog training challenges tell me about yours well scott i'm running a 18 month old dog this is his second season and he's he's really turned out to be a good dog um, one of the challenges I'm having with him is that when the wind is wrong, when the wind is at our backs, he puts his nose to the ground and hunts foot scent. And when he comes across foot scent, he will literally track those birds down. And I've watched him do it probably a half a dozen times. And he'll get out there four or five, six hundred yards with his nose to the ground working hard and he'll find those birds and he'll run them up instead of when that scent gets hotter slowing down backing off and i would like to see him recognize that and then point those birds okay i'm, I'm just a little bit confused <clears throat> because usually here's what i always used to think at least, you know, if the winds, if the winds at our back and we're walking forward, mm -hmm. that I'm, I would hope that a dog would go way out and then work back in. Does your dog do any of that or does he just get right on that ground scent and, and start working? He, he will circle to some extent. Um, yeah, he, he works out about a hundred yards, 150 yards and he'll work out there. But when the wind is wrong and he cuts, foot scent yeah his nose goes to the ground okay um if you can here's my first thought and this is from about three different professional sharp tail guides that i've worked with over the years um, rather than work downwind like that when you can um they have to a man they they are suggesting we we always hunt in a big circle and again, it takes a lot of property and it takes the right conditions. But if, if you think about it for a minute and you're, you're walking in a big circle the whole time, three quarters of the time, the wind is almost right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for that one quarter of the time when it's not, though, it sounds like you really got kind of a training issue. Have you ever trained your dog on birds that walk away or, bir or on ground scent or anything like that? Or is that something you just kind of never thought about before it's something that i've never thought about before to be honest with yeah. you yeah. um i've had other dogs that when the wind is wrong they'll i could cast them and quarter them back and forth and they did really well so this is the first dog i've ran into with that issue you know part of it is he's just an immature dog and some of this stuff he'll figure out on his own eventually but you could also you know train a little bit more for that especially that part you just talked about casting him away from say the trail that that bird has laid down um even if it means you all change directions for 100 yards and get him away from that um mm -hmm. you, you might consider that and then it's just an obedience question you know that's a hey i i'm telling you to go this way and if you're not going to obey me we got some talking uh -huh. uh, so you might consider that but the other thing you you can do is is just get him more used to running birds part of it you're obviously you're doing it already and and eventually he's going to figure out especially on wild birds that he can't catch those birds so there's really no grand finale for the dog there's no happy ending because uh, you know he he may get a lot of fun out of uh of ch chasing that ground trail and then watching the bird fly away but eventually eventually he's going to want more he's going to want a bird in his mouth and uh, mm -hmm. and so he he will put two and two together that's you know these guys who spend all summer up on the prairies in canada and uh, in north dakota and that sort of thing that's what they're hoping for on those wild sharp tails up there all these dogs are going to figure that out eventually on their own and they're just going to see it's it, it's not fun enough at some point because the dogs really do want bird feathers in their mouth uh-huh um, I, 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 the only thing I could tell you beyond that is a yet another, uh, obedience challenge. And that is when you see that dog drop his head and start trailing, you call him back to you. Right. 
And uh, I know it's not easy and it may not be in the long run. It may not be a good idea to, to kind of sour him on bird scent of any sort, but um, for a while there, it might be worth taking a look at. Right. And, and that's what I, that's what I have started doing um, <clears throat> later on in this season is, is recognizing that and pulling him back to heel and then making a big circle and trying to get the wind right on those birds. That's what we've been working on. Well, yeah, I mean, great minds think alike. I, I think I think you're doing it perfectly then. It's just a matter of repetition. It, it would be nice. It would be nice if in Oregon and Washington we had enough birds where you could let them figure it out on its own, but it seems like birds aren't that populous around here so yeah yeah we're just going to have to make do with what we have and and even if you uh, you know i i, I wouldn't suggest a, a hunting preserve and and pen raise birds because they're not going to do the running that a wild rooster is going to do they're just going to sit there until he catches them and that's the last thing you want right yeah exactly you know it's yeah. funny um uh, the year i think the seventh or eighth caller i've talked to tonight and already there's a there's a trend and the trend is you know if we just watch our dogs a little bit more carefully pay more attention to our dogs than uh rehashing the football game last night or admiring the view i think a lot of these things will be less of a problem you watch that dog watch where his nose goes and and you're going to be on top of it uh, a second or two sooner and that may be all it takes Mm-hmm. exactly yep all right well good luck on that um glad we could connect i uh, hope the rest of your season goes well thanks for being on all the right. upland nation podcast all right i really enjoy all the work you're doing thanks for having me you're welcome thank you all right bye it, it is just always fun to talk with people about their dogs and uh we'll, we'll, i guess we'll call it to end the challenges we face and the next caller is peter wettergreen peter uh what kind of dog you running uh i have a seven month old britney spaniel and a seven year old springer spaniel oh boy well that i hope they're getting along okay Oh, they get along great. That's spectacular. I'm glad to hear that. So uh, when I ask about the biggest dog training challenge you have, is it with a seven-month-old or the seven-year-old? <laughs> um, it is with the seven-month-old. Um, Remington is her name, and she has more energy than any dog I've ever owned. Um, she can run for hours at seven months old. And the problem is these days with life the way it is, you don't have two or three hours a day to run your dog um, all the time. So I'm having a challenge in calming her down so that we can actually do some effective training. Yeah, She's so high strung and so wired. She, she'll she run for 40 minutes goofing off and at, you know, at the end of the check cord for 40 minutes um, running circles around me before I can actually get her to burn off enough energy that she will calm down. And, uh, I've had a lot of advice given to me, but not really anything professional. <laughs> okay. Um, well, that, some of the <laughs> advice is, is people have told me to cut back on her food so she's got less calories, less energy. Some people have told me to don't feed her before we go to the field and practice and train. I've had people say, hold the check cord out the window of the truck for uh, two miles before you get to the field. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all don't, sorts of crazy okay, stuff. Okay, don't do that one, okay? Promise me that. <laughs> no. Uh, no, no. I'm not going to tell you all the stories I've heard, but most of them are not not good they're not there's no happy ending never in those stories no never would uh, do that one you know part of it uh yeah yeah the, the the old cliche is yeah i have to let my dog out five miles before we go hunting so he's worn out before we can go um there is some truth to the exercise part of that i i learned that five dogs ago that when most of the time when i had obedience problems with my first wire hair was because he hadn't had enough exercise that day the other one is simply the age of your dog the the dog the attention span of a seven month old dog no matter what kind of dog it is is it going to be microscopic so um you know 
maybe you could dial down the amount of training, if you will, per session. It's always better, no matter how old your dog is, how mature your dog is, it's always better to do it in little bits than it is to do in a long session. I know that's easy for me to say. I live across the driveway from where I train my dogs and and I'm self-employed so I can make my own schedule. But if you could, you know, if you can just do 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon, uh, you're probably going to be better off than 30 minutes one time a day. Uh, okay. And the dog will probably pay closer attention to you, but only for a little bit of time. So okay. shorten your sessions a little bit. If you can figure out a way to get that dog to focus, if you can so run. If one you, thing that I've tried that seems to be working is um, I have a dummy check collar or a dummy uh, uh, electric collar. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I've been putting that on her when we go to train and it somewhat seems to focus her a little bit now. Yeah. Um, that was a suggestion somebody gave me that I took and bought a dummy collar. I love it. Um, yeah. It's, and it's just the, just the putting on, you know, putting on your hunting boots, Yeah. you know, kind of thing, gets you in the frame to go yourself and walk across the field for a couple hours Yeah. And go hunting with your dog. So maybe putting on her jewelry as my wife likes to call it, um, is uh, getting her focused, but um, I, we have been seeing some betters in the last two weeks. But uh, yeah, she has for months now been just bouncing off the walls when we go out to train. Sure, and you know, part of it is maybe you're training in a place where you you're not nor she's not normally living, so she's got some excitement, some stimuli that she hasn't got elsewhere. Um, yep. She will mature, and that that's the best news. It may take some time. But, you know, the, the other thing is something, uh, whether it's a training collar or any other signal um, that says, okay, now it's down to business. I like that idea. And I, I even do that on a hunt. The mm -hmm. first thing I do with my dog, if I remember, is I, I once we're all ready, I'll let him out of the uh, the crate. And we do two or three little obedience tricks. I'll make gotcha. him heel around the truck and then I'll make him whoa while I go the other way around the truck. Uh, you know, a couple of things like that, maybe even do a retrieve, you know, a mm -hmm. 10 yard retrieve so that he says, okay, I get it. Now, when we're in the yard, the first thing I do when I'm, when I'm training almost every time is I put him up on my training table and he says, okay, all right, I know what this means. And so uh, start developing those kind of cues and the, and the collars one in particular. The other one is don't forget your dog really wants to be with you, wants to work with you, wants to perform for you to a degree, but mainly to be with you and, and get ultimately get the rewards that are due your dog at that time, whatever they are, food treats, bird in the mouth, whatever. If, while while that is taking place, if, while that thought process is taking place, if the dog is not getting any closer to those goals because she's not holding still. Um, right. Don't reward her by moving forward to the next part. Uh, I, that's a long-winded version of this. When I walk my dog at heel, and I stole this, by the way, from Ronnie Smith and probably Rick and probably Uncle Delmar before that, um, I'm walking my dog at heel and we're heading out to the field to have some fun. If he gets ahead of me, I stop. He doesn't get to go forward again until he gets back at heel. Gotcha. And it's almost comical sometimes when he figures it out. And he, man, he is, that's the fastest he ever moves <laughs> because he wants to get back to doing what he wants to get back to doing. So forestall any, any reward, even like that, walking out to the field, unless they're paying attention and doing what you want them to do at the moment. That's that and, uh, and two years of maturity are, are about all I can think of right off, Peter. I hope it helps. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping that, uh, so we mostly train her alone, but I'm hoping that when we get her into the field with the seven year old dog, that, uh, his calm demeanor and aged relaxation will uh will teach her how to to be a good dog that's my I love personal it. method is is yeah. uh, i uh 
uh, every time I get a dog that's eight years old and, and, and then I get a puppy to go along with it. And by the time the old guy's ready to retire, the, uh, the young guy's trained up and ready to be the next teacher. So I, I, I we, love all we, of that. Yeah. And, yes. and you know, what I might add to that is to, don't wait until you're out in the field. If you're training in the yard and your old guy will s- stay out of the way, but be visible to your young dog, um, mm-hmm maybe that same vibe might translate a little bit if if you're both if all three of you are out there and two of you are a mellow maybe the young dog will get the idea yeah okay well, good luck on well, all of that and uh keep yeah. us posted uh i can't wait to hear how it goes <laughs> well, well we'll keep submitting pictures to the facebook i love and, it and uh and hopefully she'll be uh, the dog of the day sometime good enough so, All right. Sounds good for everything you do. You're welcome. Bye. Oh, he's hit it on the head already. He sent me by mental telepathy, the idea that boy, oh boy, all those other people have great dogs and I can't figure out why mine doesn't fit into that category yet. Matt Templeton, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> You're, you know, l- let me just tell you, before I learn any more about your situation, everybody feels that way. I got a frantic call yet again a couple nights ago from one of the guys in my training group who uh, he just freaked out. He couldn't couldn't believe his five-month-old Griffon was not retrieving to hand yet. Now, I got a, the guy's a great guy, but he's never had a a bird dog before and so he didn't realize that it just doesn't come like that from the factory um (laughs) i don't uh, enough about uh, enough about frank and god bless you frank keep up the good work but uh, let's talk about matt's biggest dog training Mm -hmm. challenge now well i have a seventh or actually he's eight month old now um black lab and the breeders you know breeds them as a pointing lab but that I don't even care about that. Mm-hmm. And I've taken them out in the fields. Oh, pr- probably over a half dozen times. And he would rather chase my brother's dog than be interested in birds. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that's but an... we've shot birds over them yeah. and they've landed and he actually runs up to the bird and kind of sniffs it, kind of chews on it and says, Hey, look, it's right here. But it's the whole, he's not, I'm having a hard time getting him interested in hunting. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, okay, so uh, here's my uh, I'm, here's my gripe. An old dog is going to teach a new dog a lot of tricks. Some of them are good and some of them are not good. So my first thought is that dog needs to learn some boldness and some initiative by having nobody else to rely on that that runs around in the field on all four feet. So, mm-hmm. so put the old guy up for a while, even if it's for 15 or 20 minutes, um, each hunting day and be careful because your young dog really shouldn't be running more than a half hour, an hour total anyway, at that, at that stage, because of the, the, the joints and the way they develop and all of that, I'm not going to bore you with right. it. Um, right. so give, give your young dog a half hour all by himself and he'll he'll start learning about where birds are uh how he gets them in the air if you want him to or how he points them if you want him to um Mm -hmm. but he needs to learn that by himself first of all or he'll just be a follower his entire life so that's number one number two the 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 retrieving thing if you will I don't know, even in a Labrador, if you can expect that to be right there naturally at that age, unless you've done some introductory work. He he goes out, he sniffs a bird, he he might eventually come come back to you with it, but it's going to take a while, and you can start training for that. Even as a Labrador owner, you, you've got to do some introduction to the whole concept of fetch, um, depending on how how important it is and how um stringent you want to be on that you could go all the way to the to the training table and do a force fetching uh regimen if you want but with a labrador you may not need that but he he needs to understand a couple things once he's out there and he gets a whiff of that bird um if he picks it up naturally you're a step ahead if he doesn't pick it up naturally you're going to have to start teaching him what that means use the magic word fetch or whatever you like to use 
And that's got to start on the training table as well. And then once he's got it in his mouth, um, maybe he'll come back to you with it. But we don't know that yet. Um, but that's another obedience command. And the whole fetch, the, the whole fetch, force fetch or other retrieving training you do, it's really an obedience question. None of this stuff is going to occur as naturally as everybody wished it would. Okay. So yeah, I, I just, my last lab, Yeah. I took him out once and I actually found the bird and I brought him in on top of it. Mm-hmm. And from that point on, he was just like, we let him out of the car. He sniffed his buddies and then it's like, okay, let's hunt. And it was boom, we hunted. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he yeah. was he was self taught basically. Well, you've been spoiled for life. Yes. Um, and this one I like this one is so hard headed. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, you know, every dog is different. I mean, that's been another one of the yeah. themes tonight has been uh, you know, I have an eight year old and an eight month old and they're totally different animals. Well, of course they are. Every yeah. one of them is. But you know, again and it it, it's it's the motif of the evening here is at some point the light bulb is going to go off and he's going to figure out that these are fun and and i think you might help it along by letting him discover all that for himself instead of following some other guy who ultimately by the way uh, we'll be glad to carry all those birds around. And so the other guy never learns, oh, that's part of my job too. Mm-hmm. So there's some yeah. psychology in there as well yeah. for what it's worth. And and again, at that age, I don't know how much you can expect, but you can you can move things along by doing those those two things, hunt him by himself and uh, and then start teaching some aspects of the retrieve depending on who you're looking for. And if you're looking for a method for that, you can't go wrong with the smart fetch uh, method from Evan Graham. Just to Google smart fetch, and you'll find everything he's talking about. Okay. You, you'll get something out of that you can use. There's no doubt in my mind. Uh, I'm at this point. I'm taking baby steps, and all yeah. I wanted him to do is hunt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. And, and then it's like, okay, we got that part done. Yeah. Because my last dog, believe my last dog would not fetch. Up yeah. until the last time I took him hunting, he would not. He would find the dead bird and start chewing on it, but he would never bring it back to me. Oh, <laughs> sounds so, like it, a wire hair. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know what's funny? I grew up with wire hairs. My dad had two of them, and my brothers had two of them too. So it's great watching you hunt them again. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, e- even mm. mine. Uh, the, while they're not chewing many these days, they are sometimes not bringing them all the way back. But uh, that's mm-hmm. uh, that's one of the many things we're working on right now. Yeah. And and you're you're a step ahead because you mm. you figured all this out a lot sooner than a lot of people. So uh, yeah. Good luck and mm. uh, and keep us posted. Okay, I will. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your uh, help. And another Facebook comment uh, vis-a-vis to virtually every discussion we've had already tonight or today, whenever you're listening, and I appreciate that, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Joseph Day says, the biggest challenge in dog training is the owner. Okay, back to the phones we go, and our caller is Kevin Kreiner. Kevin, what kind of dog you running these days? I have a German short hair pointer and I have an English setter. Beautiful brace. You ever hunt them together? Uh, every time. Fantastic. Well, good for you. And uh, what is your biggest dog training challenge these days? Well, you know, I need to know what to do with running birds. Um, seems like uh, these pheasants like to run a lot, and of course, the dogs want to track them and chase them and i well i don't want to correct them when they're on scent so my question is what do you do boy i wish i had the answer (laughs) i you know i'm convinced uh, just for the record that if i'm going to hunt pheasants and nothing but pheasants for the rest of my life i'm going to buy flushing breeds and i'm going to run nothing but spaniels and labradors and uh, all the other more obscure little teckle hounds and things like that because 
this is a constant battle, no matter what. And, and I don't know how, how mature are your dogs? Are they, you know, have they figured the rest of this game out yet? Uh, yeah, my short hair is six years old. He's, a, he's an old pro. Um, the setter, this is his first year. I'm in Northeast country here. So we get, you know, I try to go after grouse and woodcock and, and so all the pheasants are mostly stock birds. And they still run, sounds like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, I, I, I train this way for it, and, I'm in, and it, it doesn't quite work, but it, it may help you a little bit. I don't think we're ever going to stop all pheasants from running out from under our dog. But, but you know, the the one thing we can control is – our dogs should maintain their point, even if the bird waddles away. It's easier said. Absolutely. It's well, e- well, they they will. They okay. both will. All but right. Then they want it. They want to track. Yeah. But bird ran away, and they're gonna track it. Well, then and, I, you know, my my thought. Then I don't know what to do. Yeah, and I, and I don't blame you, but it's a training process. And again, to a great degree, it's really obedience more than anything else. Um, if the dog actually will point and then will maintain that point, and this is the key, I think it sounds like, you got to teach that dog to stay on point while the bird walks away. And that's only going to happen if you can control the whole training situation. The dog and they it. do. Okay, great. So they then... Do. Then they when do they break? When I release them. Okay. They're just going to go on track. Okay. So when you release them, then they just start tracking, and then ultimately do they just get that bird up in the air too far away? Is that what happens? Normally, yeah. Yeah. So now my setter is better. He'll, he, my setter will work much slower, but then you end up tracking this bird for a half a mile. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it's better than the alternative. He's flying it wild out of range. Um, you know, so, you know, uh, then the choice becomes, do I call him off of that or do I let him do it and I just try and stay up with him? And I, and I think, you know, that's probably of the two choices, the one I would prefer. Then it's a matter of um, slowing down the track to the point where you can either catch up and stay caught up with that dog as it's tracking the bird or you teach him to stop periodically with your whistle or with your voice commands so that you can catch up again and you know the the spaniel guys and even the labrador guys now are using all sorts of signals for their dogs to sit down you know usually it's on a retrieve but you know the spaniel guys use it all the time in the field when the birds flush so that the, there's a safety thing and then it's also in the field trial world you got to do that um, so you might just continue to teach your dog that when you say whoa he needs to stop even even if he's on a track and practicing that granted is going to be a challenge but that would be what i would probably want to do is just make sure that he can stop no matter what the stimulus at your command. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. And, uh, <laughs> now my setter will, my short hair, no, he's, he won't. Well, but, he, he may be set in his well, ways. Well, <laughs> yeah. Then but you, what my problem is, when you're just running one track, you're running one bird, and now I just walk through a whole bunch of country, and I'm sure I've missed other birds in the area because that dog's just on that track. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, should I just call him off it and try to circle around? Or, you know, I, I just... Yeah, you know, if if your dog is rock solid on his obedience, you can do all of the above. And uh, we talked earlier on the podcast about uh, taking a dog off of a, 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 what I'll call a, a an off-wind track ground track uh by bringing him back and then you making a big detour away from that track and coming in from maybe the downwind side or at least the crosswind side so 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, train your dog that a ground ground scent is not motivation for disobedience. And again, you want to be artful about that because the last thing you want to do is what you started with, and that is you don't want to you don't want your dog to get sour on bird scent. So it might right. be a long process, but if if that dog has got his nose to the ground and he's tracking foot scent, um, he should he should be willing with enough practice to obey you in one way or another. And maybe it's not, uh, maybe you develop a new command that is not come back to me and leave all that fun stuff. Maybe it's a command that says, make a hard right, go 90 degrees right for a while and follow me. You know, so if you have a command, uh, you know, some people use um, over especially the retriever guys, but you can come up with a command that says, don't, it doesn't need to be all you, we're not going to spoil all the fun, but for a while go this direction. And then maybe he can come in crosswind or something like that. That's a tough one. Um, without breaking the dog completely to foot set. So good luck to you. <laughs> all right. Thanks, yeah. You're welcome. All right, to finish up our long list of callers, good friend Lance Larson. Lance, uh, sure missed uh, being able to hook up with you in Kansas this year, but maybe next year we'll resurrect our Fur Feathers Friends project. And in the meanwhile, how's that great carving business going for you? It's been a busy holiday season, that's for sure. Excellent. (laughs) Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. And if anybody wants to take a look at some of your work, uh, what is a good website address for them? Uh, LanceLarsonStudio.com. And that's the Norwegian spelling of Larson, L-A-R-S-O-N, right? Yes, it is. Okay. LanceLarsonStudio.com. I'm looking at one of your works right now, my friend, and thank you again for that. It was heartfelt and i appreciate it love doing it thank you all right now on to a happier subject i hope and that is uh, the biggest dog training challenge that you've got and uh, the first one is everybody looks askance at those uh, gray ghosts that you own i'm sure but be- <laughs> beyond that uh, uh, what's going on with those guys well it's it's a, this uh, this pup i have is the first First dog, actually, first dog I've ever trained because I've normally just adopted older dogs and just played around with them. But just I've never had uh, hunting dogs when I was young and when I was growing up. But uh, I've I've just found that you know we train him. He's he's very very smart and he knows what to do. But then I'm sure everybody else is running into this that all of a sudden your dog decides that it knows better and it all of a sudden it catches scent. If he catches scent very close, say he's on the downwind end, and all of a sudden catches the scent and just spins around, and he's six inches to three feet, somewhere in there, away from the bird, sometimes they're just not going to hold, and uh, it's it's especially if they're moving. And that's the uh, tough part, because I've seen him do it and hold beautifully with that bird under his nose, and yet other times he'll just say, nah, he's not good. No, he's not going to come up quick enough. I can get the bird myself. Yeah. So that's a <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a challenge to say the least because you don't want to jump all, all over him too much, but uh, and uh, get him blinking or anything. But uh, if they know what they're supposed to do and they don't do it, it's uh, kind of tough. <laughs> yeah, it is. And 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 every time I go, I transition in training situations. I have I have a pen full of pigeons, and I use a lot of them because they're handy. But the problem is when you when you put them in the little harnesses, for example, or you just plant them loose under a bush or something, um, they're not the sharpest knives in the bird drawer. So they don't know to be afraid of a dog that is too close, unlike wild birds. And, of course, that's the whole idea there. A wild bird's not going to put up with that stuff. They're going to be out of there, and they're going to fly hard enough. The dog's not going to catch them. And I've... I, I've come up with a ratio. I think it's uh, for every bird that your dog catches in training, it takes 20 more birds to break him of that particular instance. So part of it is just not letting that dog catch those birds. Easier said than I done. I agree. Yeah. You know, it, that's easy for us to talk about, but um, 
you, you know, uh, being able to live up to it is a little tougher. If you can control every aspect of a training situation, then you have a magical device that you put birds in that you can control from afar. And when the dog gets too close, that's a fine if he hits the point. But the moment he breaks and starts going in, you hit the red button, the bird flies away, and he gets no reward. That um, that seems to be a recurring theme tonight. Um, it, and again, it, it, it's easy if you have a bird launcher. If you don't have a bird launcher, then you got to have a check cord, and you probably have to have a helper as well. Um, and you need to uh, stage manage every aspect of that. And for you know, for 50 birds, your dogs have got to be on the check cord, and you've got to be on the other end. And the moment that dog hits the scent and locks up you got to wrap that thing around. you got to dally that thing on your saddle horn and hold tight so that he can't catch the bird no matter what, even if he's four inches away. Um, yep. That is, that is the, the only way I've ever found to ensure steadiness in a dog. And once that happens, you can do all sorts of things. We've been Gosh, this summer we were pushing birds around. They wouldn't fly even after they went out of the launcher and they'd land right where they, you know, popped out. And as long as your dog has been worked on birds for a while in the right way, he's more inclined to hold that point, especially if he understands that's the only way he's going to be able to hold a bird in his mouth eventually. Um, You know, but I still believe that a lot of it has to do with where they're catching the scent i think uh sure if they get it all of a sudden they're they're catching it that close that's mm-hmm. a problem for everybody you know because it's not just the scent then they see the bird uh, yeah. for example this last weekend i was out at a uh, our pointing dog club had a, a competition called the chucker challenge where we got to go out a, a pair of guys went out with a dog and we had to get four uh, four chuckers out of the field and uh my dog zane Locked on point on the first bird, held to steady the wing shot and fall, retrieved fine. The second bird he caught on the downwind, swung around and busted it out. But then the next two birds he found, he held straight at, you know, just like he was supposed to all the way and retrieved. So I think it's got to be that down, for me, it's the downwind when he grabs it and it grabs it, he's downwind of the bird and all of a sudden catches it real close. That's the, uh, that's a sticker <laughs> I got to get over. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and part of that because we had this issue with the last um the last Navda uh test that I gunned at. Um we had people who um were inexperienced at planting birds. Let me just be diplomatic there. Mm-hmm. And and so sure. they, they you know, they do what they could, you know, some people put the head under the wing and some people say it's got to be the left wing and you know, or you dizzy up in various ways. And all of that you got to do because you're in a test and that's how it's got to happen. But what never happened was putting those birds in a place where they were basically invisible to the dog. So when you have the chance and you're doing the bird planning, uh, hide those birds extremely well so that when the, yeah. when the scent, no matter whether the scent is six inches or six feet or six yards away, um, the dog cannot see the bird. And I think that will help eliminate one trigger. The oh, o- yes. The other, the other thing that I've been doing with Flick a lot, and it's paying off, is whatever I'm using for the training bird and how I'm uh, restraining it and then ultimately flying it, I'm, I'm laying down a whole bunch of that commercial bottled scent as well. And you can do two things with that. Number one, you can put it on the bird or on the harness or on the launcher, which is what I do. Um, and it's so strong that the dog will get that scent from way back and it will be strong enough. The dog won't feel a need to get closer to get more scent. So he won't, what they call road in to the bird. He hits that scent and it is, it is a snoot full. So all of a sudden he doesn't need to get closer to get more. And this is an old time trick from okay. way back. Um, what, again, however you restrain birds, uh, I like to do it with two launchers, but you don't need to. 
you 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 want to bring the dog into the scent cone you want him to steady up and hold that point and for a while you want to check cord on him because the last thing you want him to do is crash in on anything fly the far bird and then oh okay. then he's starting to put two and two together once he does that then you can probably squeeze those birds a little closer together but for a while there he gets sent from the close bird, but he'll see the bird fly from farther away and he'll start understanding. You don't need to get that close. He can still smell it pretty well. So good luck on both right. of those. And uh, with luck, something will take. Most of it will well, be just age. What's the worst, Scott? I mean, yeah, it's a bad day out in the field with your dog, and that's automatically a good day out in the field because you're with your dog. So, oh gosh, yeah, I'll <laughs> there's never... no downtime. There's I, no I, down down part of this. It's I, just all great. I remember rationalizing that exactly, Lance, on my first wire hair, thinking I might have the world's first flushing wire hair, and and I was okay with that. And yeah. Then, now I've got a little bit more taste or patience or something. So. Uh, yeah, but he'll do great, and it, it really is a matter of um, bird contact and learning that he can't catch the birds. However you can however you can prevent that, that's what you need to do, at least in my considered opinion. Yeah, yeah. companion first, field second, have fun, enjoy, your, enjoy the time no matter where it is. I couldn't say it better than that, my friend. Enjoy the rest of your season. It's great talking with you. Thanks a lot for being on the Upland Merry Nation Christmas podcast. To you and thanks for calling. Wow. I hope you learned as much as I did, and I hope I was able to dispense a little bit of, um, I don't know what to call it, some, some useful suggestions to some of the folks out there. There are a bunch of common themes going on, and that ought to be a magazine or a blog post or something, at least uh, somewhere down, down the road. But in the meanwhile, uh, thanks for putting up with me and for, with everybody else. Until this, the bitter end of the Upland Nation podcast. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank all the callers, uh, especially those who waited a long time towards the end there, Lance and Kevin and Matt. I would sure appreciate a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. It does help. In fact, it helps a lot. Please subscribe to the podcast as well. That's another way they measure that stuff, and it all helps because at some point our sponsors need to look at those numbers. And then, of course, tell your friends. Stay in touch on the Upland Nation Facebook page and at the Wing Shooting USA Facebook page. Get more information about our guests on the UplandNation.com website. And if you want to talk, you know how to do it. We can do it here. We can do it on Facebook. Or you can always send me an email at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. Happy New Year. Be safe. Hug your dog. Talk to you soon. And in the meanwhile, see you in the field. <laughs>